Bismillahirrahmanirrahim and welcome um, to Band Negara Malaysia Tuan-tuan dan puan-puan uh, pada sidang akhbar ini Band Negara Malaysia akan menyampaikan taklimat mengenai prestasi pertumbuhan ekonomi negara pada suku tahun kedua 2018 Taklimat ini juga merangkumi perkembangan monetari dan kewangan di Malaysia isu khas serta butiran mengenai inisiatif dasar Band Negara Malaysia. Taklimat ini turut dihadiri oleh uh, Ketua Perangkawan Malaysia, Datuk Seri Dr. Muhammad Uzir Mahidin. Uh, Jabatan Perangkaan Malaysia adalah agensi rasmi yang mengumpul dan menerbit statistik uh, KDNK negara. Following a period of continuous strength of in global growth since late 2016, most recent indicators suggest that global economic momentum, although still strong, is showing some signs of moderation. High frequency global indicators such as monthly purchasing managers index, PMI, and export volumes have recorded a more moderate expansion in recent months. This is evidenced by the mixed second quarter 2018 GDP outturns across the world, showing that global growth has started to be less synchronized. While US growth continued to accelerate, major economies such as the Euro area and regional peers including China, the Philippines and Singapore recorded slower growth in the second quarter compared to the first quarter. Turning to Malaysia, the second quarter of 2018 was an eventful quarter. For some, it will be remembered for the 14th general election, the beginning of a one-off tax holiday and significant improvement in consumer and business sentiments. Although the headlines may have been dominated by these topics, the economy in the second quarter of 2018 also faced supply shocks that affected production in both the mining and agricultural sectors. The Malaysian economy registered a slower growth of 4.5% in the second quarter. This mainly reflects sector-specific shocks that weigh down growth in both the agriculture and mining sectors. The mining sector was affected by the natural gas supply disruptions while the agriculture sector was weighed down by a sharp decline in palm oil and rubber production. Nevertheless, the services and manufacturing sectors, which account for about 80% of GDP, continued to support growth. The services sector was driven mainly by growth in the wholesale and retail trade subsector, while the manufacturing sector growth was supported by continued growth in the E&E &E and consumer-related clusters. On the demand side, growth was weighed down by lower net exports and public investment. The weakness in the mining and agriculture sectors contribute to a mod moderation in exports. At the same time, public investment registered a contraction as some of the large projects like Rapid, Petronas Strain 9 LRG facility near the tail end of construction. Federal government development expenditure also contracted during the quarter, further weighing on public investment growth. In June, federal government development expenditure contracted by 28.7%. However, private sector activity continued to anchor growth. Household spending was supported by favourable income and employment conditions with an additional impetus from the tax holiday. Firms continued to invest amid improving business sentiment and higher capacity utilisation in the quarter. Private consumption grew strongly by 8%, driven by continued private sector wage growth and significant improvement in consumer sentiments. The zero rating of GST since June lent further support to household spending. Going forward, private consumption will benefit from favourable labour market conditions with additional impetus from higher spending due to the tax holiday. Private investment expanded at a faster pace of 6.1%, which reflects a significant rebound from the underperformance in the first quarter. The better performance was supported by favourable demand conditions amid continued high capacity utilisation. 
Looking ahead, investment activity is expected to be supported by ongoing projects in both the export-oriented, for example, the E&E &E and primary-related manufacturing subsectors, and domestic-oriented sectors, for example, the transport and utility services subsectors. Gross exports expanded at 8.2%, supported by continued demand from Malaysia's major trade partners. Domestic exports, which measures exports of locally produced goods, turned around to register a marginal positive growth of 0.2%. Gross imports rebounded to re register a positive growth of 7.7%, underpinned by robust re-export activity and recovery in capital imports amid stronger domestic investment activity. Going forward, Malaysia's export performance is expected to remain firm. This is supported by continued demand from major trade partners and expansion in the global technology cycle as well as increased domestic production capacity. At this juncture, I would like to invite Datuk Sri Uzair to explain on domestic exports. Uh, thank you, Datuk. On uh, Malaysia uh, external trade, uh, for the last uh, few quarter, we see that uh, the the gross export uh, is uh, also influenced uh, largely by the re-export. So the, for the last few quarters, uh, a lot of the activities such as uh, distribution and also storage uh, take place uh, uh, in, in Malaysia. So it's important that uh, to see that uh, what the actual uh, export of the product from the Malaysia. So in uh, in this uh, context, uh, we would like to highlight that uh, the, the, the domestic export is something that the actual product is going to the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. So during these quarters, uh, we see that uh, our uh, domestic export is uh, a bit lower from the, the previous one. Malaysia's um, current account continued to register a healthy surplus of 3.9 billion ringgit in the second quarter of 2018, or equivalent to 1.2% of GNI. In comparison to the first quarter, the current account surplus narrowed. This was due mainly to the lower goods surplus driven by a rebound in goods imports following stronger domestic demand and weaker commodity exports. In addition, the primary income deficit widened to the higher dividends earned by foreign investors in the domestic economy. Typically, the current account balance tends to be the lowest in the second quarter, due mainly to lower goods surplus. This is driven by seasonal factors, such as lower commodity exports in a quarter. Moving forward, the current account is expected to remain in surplus, as the goods surplus will continue to be supported by global demand, and commodity <coughs> exports. With the first half current account balance steady at 2.8% of GNI, we believe that for the full year this year, the current account balance will be at 2 to 3% of GNI. In fact, it will be at the lower end of this range. Headline inflation declined to 1.3% in the second quarter of 2018, mainly reflecting the zeroization of the GST. The decline in inflation was offset by transport inflation during the quarter. Nevertheless, the RON95 petrol price helped to contain further increases in fuel inflation. With headline inflation is expected to moderate in 2018, the extent of moderation would depend on the pass-through from changes in the consumption tax policy. Underlying inflation, which excludes the impact of changes in the consumption tax policy, is expected to remain stable. Uh, at this juncture, I would like to inv invite Datuk Sri Uzay uh, to add his comments on the overall performance of the economy. Can we uh, flash the, the supply chain? Yeah. <coughs> So we look at the performance on the this second quarter on the demand side that uh, we see that there are strong uh, uh, growth on the private finance consumption where is registered a growth of 
uh, 8.0%. Uh, this growth is largely supported by higher consumption in food uh, and also non-alcoholic beverages which rose uh, 6.5 percent and the uh, communication uh, increased 10.6 uh, uh, percent and restaurant and hotel grew uh, at 8.6 uh, percent. This is really in line with the event like uh, Hari Raya IDP3 uh, and also the school header and during this period also we have the World Cup and in terms of the gross uh, fit computer permission as mentioned by Dr. Gamno just now is uh, largely supported by the uh, private sector and uh, in terms of government final consumption expenditure registered gross of 3.1 percent and uh, on the uh, export uh, grew at 2.0 percent and the uh, import register a uh, higher growth of 2.1 percent so during this time we see that uh, they are moderated in the net export eh, uh, at 1.7 percent uh, in overall uh, we see that uh, our demand uh, base is now is on the private uh, uh, final consumption so at the moment the share of the private consumption uh, to GDP is at the uh, highest uh, at 55.2% uh, and followed by a uh, gross peak of information at 26.4%. Uh, uh, Thank you, Dr. Okay. Turning now to our monetary policy. Um, at the meetings in May and July, the MPC maintained the degree of monetary accommodation as domestic monetary policy <coughs> considerations have not materially changed. The MPC will continue to monitor risk to the prospects for domestic growth and inflation, which could arise from global and domestic factors. The current monetary policy stance remains supportive of economic activity. The bank's monetary operations will continue to ensure sufficient liquidity in supporting orderly money and foreign exchange markets and intermediation activity. Domestic financial system stability was preserved in the second quarter of 2018. The financial system remained resilient. Domestic financial markets continued to function in an orderly manner and confidence in the financial system was sustained. The banking system and insurance industry remained well capitalized to meet unexpected shocks. As at end June this year, excess capital buffers of financial institutions remain strong at 235.3 billion ringgit and stress tests conducted by the bank affirm financial institutions resilience to severe macroeconomic and financial shocks both at the system and institutional levels private sector activity remains supported by sustained financing growth in the second quarter of 2018 at 6.3 percent in the capital market, corporate bond issuances continued to register double-digit growth, providing crucial funding for infrastructure developments and working capital. Total outstanding loan growth increased to 4.4% in the second quarter, driven by higher growth of loans to businesses. Household loan growth remained steady. The ringgit depreciated against the US dollar in the second quarter and has depreciated by 0.9% against the US dollar this year until 16 August 2018. This was driven mainly by external developments, namely expectations for a faster pace of normalization in the US, escalating trade tensions and <coughs> contagion from Turkey to other emerging markets. The ringgit depreciation in 2018 was in line with regional currencies. While other regional currencies has depreciated between 1.8 to 8.8 percent, the ringgit has depreciated by 0.9 percent against the US dollar. Despite non resident portfolio outflows in the second quarter, financial conditions remain stable and generally in line with regional countries. The domestic bond remain resilient during the period supported by domestic institutional investors. The KLCI declined by 9.2% during the period, in line with regional trend amid uncertainties on the pace of monetary policy normalization in the US and rising trade tensions. 
Clibor and FD rates also remain stable in the second quarter. Onshore foreign currency volume continues to show improvement while stable foreign exchange rates promote efficient price discovery. Bond yields have been anchored by long-term domestic and foreign investors, signaling confidence <coughs> towards the country's strong fundamentals. Against this backdrop, the bank continues to strive for greater transparency in the bond market through the ultimate beneficial ownership or UBO project. All 72 custodian banks, including Euroclear, have given their commitment to support this initiative. The bank continues to assess the onshore market conditions, especially external developments that may lead to an increase in volatility or imbalances in the on onshore financial market. Ringgit continues to be market determined and the bank will continue to provide liquidity and ensure orderly market conditions to support economic activities. As at end June 2018, non-resident holdings of Malaysian government bonds declined from 27.4% to 23.7% due to net outflows because amidst Fed rate hike expectations and global uncertainties mainly stemming from the trade tensions between US and China. Of significance, the composition of stable investors has increased, leading to lower market volatility and greater resilience in the bond market. These long-term investors include central banks or government holdings, which stood at 33.5%, pension funds holding of around 18%, and banks holding at 3.6%. Malaysia's external debt remains manageable. If you, this, is, this observation is based on the nature and profile of our external debt. The, the first uh, pie on the round circle shows that more than half of our external debt is skewed towards medium to longer term tenure, resulting in limited rollover risk. Short-term external debt does not pose a material risk. Banks, you can see from the chart, account for close of 70% of total short-term external debt. And they observe prudent liquidity management practices and management of funding and maturity mismatches. About one-third of the external debt is in ringgit and accounted by non-resident purchasing the ringgit instrument. Hence, this, is not, this portion of the external debt is not vulnerable to valuation changes from the fluctuation in the ringgit exchange rate. And if you can see from the chart, more than half of foreign currency denominated debt is subject to either prudent liquidity management practices by the banks uh, on flexible terms uh, because most of them are intercompany loans or in terms of take credits which are backed by export earnings. Importantly, while there is no immediate threat from the level and composition of external debt, the bank will continue to monitor its trajectory to ensure its sustainability going forward. International reserves remain sufficient to meet international transactions. There is often a narrow focus on short-term external debt reserves cover which stood at 0 0.9 times. The short term, as I explained in the previous chart, the short term external debt is mostly by banks, which arise because of the centralization of treasury operations by the domestic banks, which operate in the region, and the sizable presence of foreign banks in Malaysia that rely on funding from their parent and related companies. It should be highlighted as that the, although the bank's short term external debt is around 311.9 billion ringgit. The bank's external assets is around 293 billion ringgit. And these external assets can be drawn upon to meet the short term external debt obligation of the banks without creating a claim on our reserves. Similarly, the progressive liberalization of foreign exchange administration rules has resulted in greater decentralization of reserves, whereby three-quarters of major external assets 
are held by banks and corporations. Thus, Malaysia's short-term external debt remains manageable and does not pose a material risk to the economy. Malaysia's reserves coverage ratio to short-term external debt is comparable against other financially open economies in the region. Of significance, I would like to stress again, Malaysia's short-term external debt reflects increasing regionalization footprint of our domestic banks, strong establishment of locally incorporated foreign banks in Malaysia, and Malaysia's deeper and more well-developed financial markets. The actual growth performance in the first half was lower than earlier projections. At this point, we observe growth weaknesses, weakness confined to specific sectors and, and due to specific factors and not generalized throughout the economy. In fact, like what I have said before, private sector activity remains firm. By our latest estimate, growth for 2018 is likely to be around 5%, lower than our earlier projection. At this new range, growth remains firm and Malaysia continues to be one of the fastest growing economies in the region. Going forward, the growth momentum will be supported by uh, the following factors. First, sustained global growth and trade momentum will support trade activity. Second, private sector spending is expected to benefit from continued positive spillovers from external demand. Recent indicators also point towards an improvement in business and consumer sentiments. And thirdly, household spending will be supported by favorable labor market conditions and additional spending from the tax holiday. Let me end this section. It is important to note that the steady growth path of the domestic economy is supported by sound macroeconomic fundamentals. The economy is well diversified in terms of sources of growth as well as export products and markets. Labour market conditions remain favourable, underpinned by continued wage and employment growth. The current account continues to re register a surplus and Malaysia's deep financial markets with strong financial buffers will ensure orderly market conditions in the face of financial market headwinds. Given these sound fundamentals, Malaysia is well placed to undertake deeper structural reforms that will position the economy on a firmer footing to withstand medium to longer medium to long term global and domestic challenges. Allow me now to provide some insights on key economic issues and updates on policy initiatives by the bank. The quarterly bulletin, as you all are aware, provides a detailed account on these issues and initiatives. The first article is on divergence of economic performance and public sentiments. Despite the strong macroeconomic performance in recent years of late, there have been some reservations that the high GDP growth has not translated into improvements in the overall well-being of Malaysians. This article seeks to explain what appears to be a disconnect between Malaysia's strong headline economic figures and sentiments on the ground. Several factors may have contributed to this divergence, including first, the level of income is low and unevenly distributed, significantly affecting household economic well-being. Second, the effects of higher cost of living, particularly on lower income households. Third, high debt obligations coupled with deteriorating housing affordability. And finally, households worsening perception of corruption and governance which fuel skepticism over the strength of the Malaysian economy. For policy makers, apart from focusing on macro headline figures such as GDP and inflation, there needs to be more attention on the distributional aspects of growth we sharper focus on the quality of jobs created, cost of living, and housing affordability. The second article in our quarterly bulletin is on the potential of mobile payments in accelerating Malaysia's migration to e-payments. This will lead to one, greater cost savings and efficiency gains, and two, lower risk of leakages through illicit activities such as tax evasion, 
and corruption. Mobile payment remains at an early stage of development in Malaysia, but is rapidly gaining traction among the entry of new non-bank players offering mobile payment services. To foster an enabling environment for mobile payments while managing the resultant risk, the bank has introduced the Interoperable Credit Transfer Framework, which took effect on 1st July this year. The ICTF seeks to mitigate risks of market fragmentation by establishing a shared payment infrastructure that connects bank accounts to non-bank accounts. With the implementation of the real-time retail payment platforms expected by the end of this year by Paynet, Malaysians will soon be able to make seamless and secure payments between bank and non-bank accounts via the use of simple identifiers such as mobile phone, IC and business registration numbers and the, the use of a common quick response or QR code as we normally call it. Finally, the bank is committed to review its foreign exchange administration of FEA rules from time to time in accordance with the changing global and domestic conditions. In times of uncertainty, FEA rules help to accord financial stability, but at the same time provide flexibility to businesses to respond to the current environment. Based on this principle, the bank wishes to announce the following. We will allow businesses greater flexibility in managing its export proceeds by re removing the reconversion process. In effect, exporter can now automatically sweep the export proceeds upon establishing their six-month foreign currency obligations with onshore banks. We will also allow residents to manage their foreign currency exposure subject to approval from the bank for hedging of foreign currency obligations beyond six months and hedging of foreign currency invoices arising from domestic trades in goods and services between residents. Finally, we will allow greater access for non-residents to our onshore market through trades in ringgit interest rate derivatives via the authorized um, office or AOOs subject to back-to-back -back arrangement with onshore banks. While FEA rules above will give greater flexibility for businesses and indiv individuals to manage their activities in terms of uncertainty, it is the bank's ultimate core objective to preserve and maintain financial stability. I have come to the end of the presentation to recap. The economy registered a slower growth of 4.5% in the second quarter on account of production shocks in mining and agriculture. Other sectors continued to register firm growth performance amid sustained demand from the private and external sectors. As a result, Malaysia is expected to remain on a steady growth path in 2018 and 2019, supported by strong macroeconomic fundamentals and sufficient buffers to weather domestic and external shocks. The growth performance and the fact that our economic fundamentals remain sound provide a window of opportunity for the country to embark on deep reforms that will put Malaysia Baru on solid economic footing.